this house would populate Mars. I doubt there's ever been a bolder proposition made in this historic hall, and I am so proud to stand here in support of it. Sailing on HMS Beagle in 1832, a young naturalist once wrote, how great would be the desire in every admirer of nature, if such were possible, to behold the scenery of another planet. You can almost hear Darwin's contemporaries scoffing. Yet a century later, Buzz Aldrin described to us the magnificent desolation of the lunar surface. Today, NASA and 15 international partners are preparing for a permanent and sustainable return to the moon. The Chinese and Russians are working on a similar attempt. Space settlement is here, my friends, and it's a good thing. Homo erectus ventured out of Africa a million and a half years ago into Asia and Europe, but it was more than just 20,000 years ago that explorers from Asia settled my home state of California. Europeans arrived only in the last few hundred years. Today there are 40 million diverse Californians, mostly from recent immigration. By selecting for risk takers, this has made California the global center of innovation and the fifth largest economy on Earth. The best ideas in consumer technology, in spaceflight, entertainment, and automobiles come from California. That is the power of human migration. Even NASA's Mars rovers are made at California's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. These automobile-sized nuclear-powered beasties are comparable in complexity to the lander we'd need to put a human on Mars. Human exploration of Mars is not a matter of technically possible, but a matter of the means and the will to do so. We can't afford to do this. NASA's appropriation of $24 billion is less than one half of 1% of US governmental spending. That's a fraction of the cost overrun for the F-35 program, which could be half a trillion dollars in a fraction of Medicare fraud, waste, and abuse, which hits about $100 million. There are others with both the means and the will to settle space. Elon Musk SpaceX is building massive rockets on the coast of Texas designed to carry hundreds of settlers to the red planet. Jeff Bezos and partners are preparing to build a huge space station called the Orbital Reef. We should be in awe at the audacity of this ambition. We mustn't let the fretting of the Earth's meek restrain our risk takers. We become an evolutionary dead end to be swept away by some more ambitious life form when we cease to explore and expand. I know we face grave challenges here on Earth, perhaps existential ones. Many of these are human artifacts, nuclear war, climate change, nanobot swarms, treacherous AI, bioengineered pandemics. We also face the possibility of mass extinctions driven by ice ages, killer asteroids, supervolcanoes. These are regularly recorded in Earth's geological history. Our species and our precious biosphere need a backup plan if we are to survive. That plan cannot start with fix every problem here on Earth before you do anything. Earth first is a honeydew list that by definition will never be complete. Such thinking is the psychosis of failure. A closed system cannot ever be 100% efficient. Thermodynamics promises us that nothing is sustainable. There are no perpetual motion machines. We could sacrifice, uh, reduce our standard of living, surrender our individual freedom, and struggle on for a while longer as more efficient ants, but in the end, Malthus is right. If we stay here and don't open up the solar system, we will pollute our precious planet, and we will end up fighting to death over those resources like the previous speaker mentioned. That is the problem. Space, on the other hand, offers tremendous potential, huge external resources that are virtually infinite, and the room to expand, unburdening our biosphere and preserving this uniquely beautiful planet. The opposition may suggest that we should value a theoretical Martian ecosystem more than our own. Planetary protection advocates will, will fret over the imagined rights of some hypothetical slime mold hiding in the Valley Marineris. That's an utterly daft assertion. All of life is and has been a competition between species. Humans are not outside of nature. 
We are an apex product of nature. Like our distant ancestors who hauled themselves out of the primordial sea or the ones who climbed down from the trees, our evolutionary capacity, dare I say our destiny, is to carry life to the solar system and to eventually the stars. Failing to do so is failing our species and our planet. There have been significant exchanges of materials between Mars and Earth in the form of meteorites blasted off the surface of both planets. It's likely that life has traveled in both directions many times over hundreds of millions of years and will continue to do so. It is even possible that life originated on the older red planet and was carried to Earth via this process of panspermia. Let us return the favor. Robert Zubert in the Mars Society remarked to me, we know far more about Earth than any other planet because we live here. Bob's right. Over the last half century, we have spent billions and billions of dollars sending fleets of magnificent robots to Mars, but we still have no idea as to whether those rovers are crushing microorganisms or fossils under their wheels. A single human visitor with a decent high school laboratory could solve that dilemma in a day. We must live on Mars to truly know Mars, and that will be a remarkable process of scientific discovery. Humans living in contained habitats will not extinguish every bacterial princess of Mars. If someday we should be so bold as to terraform Mars into a second Earth, any local fauna can be moved to a microorganism zoo where scientists, and not the sort you should invite to your parties, might study them to their heart's content. While challenges of radiation and reduced gravity are real, they are understood and addressable. Ignacy Casanova, professor of environmental chemistry and planetary science, urged me to tell you it is unscientific to believe that human beings will never manage to live on Mars. Interstellar Labs, a startup in Paris, is developing a line of closed environmental pods that will someday house us on Mars. And now they're using these to solve agricultural dilemmas and model climate change right here on Earth. Solving big engineering challenges produces positive externalities that reduce inequality for all. Imagine me 50 years ago presenting to you the proposition, this house supports spending billions of dollars in space to improve the accuracy of American smart bombs. You would head for the nose door in a flash. But today we call that system GPS, and without it you wouldn't have Uber or Pokemon Go. Is that still a thing? Uh, GPS contributes trillions of dollars to the global economy, saves thousands of lives, and greatly reduces emissions by increasing transportation efficiency. World War II, a terrible thing, unintentionally gave us jet travel, nuclear power, microwave ovens, and computing. What unexpected benefits will the settling of Mars bring to everyone on Earth? Yet, in the 1960s, opponents of the Apollo program offered the same jury arguments you will hear from these folks tonight. Man was not meant to fly in space. Robots can do the work cheaper and safer. And we have more important problems to solve right here on Earth. If they had had their way, we might not have PCs, the internet, the phone some of you are trying to sneak looks at. Um, we'd know a lot less about our planet as well. Space access, developed during the Cold War, allowed us to detect the ozone hole in the 1970s and recognize climate change in the 1980s. Most of the good data for climate change still comes from space. Space-based solutions are the best choice for solving these problems. Space solar power, for instance, is far more efficient in powering the Earth than ground-based panels. As you listen to the sanctimonious arguments from those who would gleefully doom our civilization, and despoil our precious planet in a misguided effort to thwart the hubris of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, please consider this quote from Frank Delaney in his novel, Ireland. Anytime a great man tries to do something wonderful, lesser men will try to stop him. That is a law of life. I urge you to be great men and women I urge you to explore new worlds and to boldly go through the eye door with me this evening. Thank you. <laughs>